Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So can everybody hear me okay when I hold the mic here? Okay, this is okay for everybody? <coughs> so it's very nice to be here today and just to see everybody here and also to see my uh, Dhamma friends, Ajahn Kovilo, Ajahn Nisabo, who I've just known for a very long time. So, uh, and uh, Ajahn Kovilo ordained at Abayagiri, Ajahn Nisabo lived for two years or a year and a half. About a year and a half, yeah, to buy a Geary. yeah. So a lot of this, what we're trying to do, the, the Buddha has this phrase that Kalyanamitta, the spiritual friendship, is the whole of the holy life, so um, just good friends, good uh, companions in the holy life, in the spiritual life, so we do need good supports and uh, people people who can encourage us in the practice. And we find this, uh, we have to have these techniques, and over time what I've, of what I've seen practicing for, uh, I just turned 44 and I've been a bhikkhu for about 22 years, so um, what I've seen over, over these years is that uh, there has to be an entryway into wholesome qualities. So we hear a lot of teachings about Nibbana or the deathless, and even a lot of teachings about Anapanasati, but I found each of us as individuals really has to come up with ways to enter into the wholesome mind. And I found uh, one is that reflection on spiritual friendship, good spiritual friendship, but that actually dovetails with another uh, reflection or quality that we're trying to develop, which is katanyu katawedi, and that's gratitude. That's normally translated as gratitude. And so using gratitude as a gateway into things like metta, so something like metta, like what was translated normally as loving kindness or goodwill, uh, there has to be an entry point into it because if we want to truly have goodwill, then it's it's hard to do if we're angry and irritated, so and frustrated. So we, and we can't just switch it and and change into that wholesome state. We need to, we need to have an entry point. So I found gratitude is a good entry point. So and the way I do that myself is that when uh, contemplating alms food, so getting offered the meal, then sitting and looking at the food in my bowl, then consciously bringing up that this really strong, not, not just a conceptual thought, but actually a feeling of gratitude, a feeling of strong gratitude while looking at the food that's, that I'm about to eat that's been, that's been offered to me. And then that tends to go into wow, I can't, uh, all these things I've been given, I've been given so many things, material things, I've been given teachings, I've been given so much that I even, to the point where it can be almost overwhelming how much I've, how many good things I've been given in my life, and then the little nagging irritations and frustrations can seem like nothing. <clears throat> so that can be a really good entry point. <clears throat> into uh, goodwill, into metta, metta kamatana. Because with metta, so it's said that we try to spread that to ourselves. We try to give metta to ourselves first. And uh, this is also something that I, when I first started out at Abayagiri and I was inspired by the austerity of the Thai forest tradition and reading stories about Lumpur Cha and the Kruba Ajans undergoing austerities and living and living with all sorts of privations and following very, very strict precepts and 
cultivating strong renunciation. So right off the bat, going into a Bayagiri, those were the things that inspired me and these very kind of yang practices. And uh, so I was, had this idea that we should eat very, very little. And, and also I, I was quite uh, arrogant when I first went to a Bayagiri. So all oh, these monks aren't practicing. And they're not doing what I read about in Lumpur Cha and the Kruba Ajans. It looks like they're just wasting their time. They're playing around. And, and so, uh, so I was, uh, but I was still inspired by Lumpur Pasano. He was able to really exemplify the, the Kruba Ajans. So that kept me there. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, and I thought, well, metta is for sissies. I'm not going to practice metta. So I already, I don't need metta. I don't need metta. I need st sitting up all night and austerities and not eating very much and harshness. I need more harshness. So it wasn't verbalized in that way. But uh, looking back, that's what it was. And I also kept a uh, journal. I did a lot of journaling in my first year, my Anagarka year. And when I f got to the end of this notebook, I, I looked back on it. And the entire journal had a very clear theme to it. I, what I thought was I was writing very inspiring things and inspiring teachings and recording inspiring teachings, and yet uh, it had a very clear theme that it was all really strong criticisms of myself. So like, you, can, you shouldn't be doing this. You should be better in this way, better in that way, better in that way. And I thought that was a good thing for a, a while. So uh, eventually, um, I found that I did need to cultivate metta, and it, it was in my ninth vasa that I finally felt like I was able to actually have some sort of metta for myself. I had some metta for myself because of going to the monastery means at least I wanted something good for myself. But to really truly wish myself well and actually mean it, that was a whole other thing. That's very, very difficult. So. We can go through these phrases of, may I be well, may I be happy, may I have success. We can go through those affirmation type phrases, but can we say, may I be well and really mean it? Can we say, may I be happy and really genuinely mean it? That's, that's a whole other thing that's very difficult. So I do believe that's what the Buddha is talking about when he says metta for yourself is, is actually, may I be well and may I truly be well in terms of saying that to myself and really meaning it. And then if we're able to do that, then that's that's a really heart-opening, eye-opening and heart-opening experience. And then once we're able to do that, only then can we truly have meta for others because I don't, I haven't studied much psychology, but it seems that we tend to treat others how we treat ourselves. We tend to treat others how we treat ourselves. So if we're very judgmental and critical towards ourselves, we'll tend to be very judgmental and critical towards others. And if others, if we see others who are very judgmental and critical, we can also go the other way. They're probably that way towards themselves. And so that leads to compassion. So that's the quality of compassion, seeing that. So there, there's this uh, slight difference between metta and karuna in terms of the way we focus on it, the, the angle we come at it with, they're both very wholesome qualities. But metta, uh, goodwill, is wishing that ourselves and others be happy. And then karuna, compassion, is wishing that ourselves and others be free of suffering. So it's kind of the same thing, but it's taken at a different angle. It's taken at a different angle. And then mudita, the uh, the third of these Brahma Viharas that we chanted at the beginning, Mudita is normally translated as sympathetic joy, which I've never liked that translation, and I've wondered at that, and it might be because it just has the word pathetic in it, <laughs> if, and and so it kind of uh, doesn't land with me very well, just because that's part of the word sympathetic. And I was going into a uh, uh, friend, Tanamura Siri, uh, uh, Indian monk at Tisarana who's fluent in Sanskrit and Pali, and he comes from a Brahmin family, so trying to come up with an alternative translation for mudita, and he's got so much knowledge with Pali and Sanskrit, and it's, we had a lot of fun having a long conversation about this mudita, 
And he said, actually, just, just rejoicing, because it's something that it's, a, it's not actually dependent on others. So we normally think of, oh, wishing a, a sense of joy and happiness at the success of others uh, in terms of sympathetic joy. But then, actually, it's rejoicing. It's something we can do. We can rejoice over our own good qualities, and we, and we should, actually, not in an arrogant way, but actually and wholesome pride and acknowledging what we've done. And this also, gratitude is also something that is very, very much linked with mudita. It's very much linked with katanyu katavedi, with, with gratitude. And these are, this is a very, very uh, refined quality, this, this quality of rejoicing. And that comes also back to gratitude because Say if you reflect on something like if you're given a gift or given food or like the monks are given alms food all the time and if we're reflecting on our food and that sense of rejoicing comes up, rejoicing in the generosity, rejoicing in the generosity of others, then there could be that strong inner smile that comes up and that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful when that happens. Then we have equanimity, uh, upeka, which is considered the uh, conditioned quality, which is the closest to Nibbana. So it's the condition, in the conditioned world, Upeka is supposed to be the closest to Nibbana, so equanimity. And with equanimity, it's a sense of, I don't think of it as indifference, because it's not just between good and bad. It's not just neutral, it's not just indifferent, but it's more like, deep serenity or equipoise we could think of it it goes together with one pointedness it's equipoise it's balance incredible balance so we have these three qualities the way one of the ways i th like to think of equanimity in terms of practice and it comes back to uh the simile of the desert that the buddha used in the suttas where he describes pity and sukha and he describes how they're different. So if you're walking through a desert and you're hot and parched and tired and thirsty, and then you, you crest over one of the sand dunes and you see an oasis, pity is what you would feel. So that's, that's like a sense of excitement. And, um, but you don't, just, you don't just go circumambulating the oasis and keep feeling all that excitement you actually go into the oasis and you jump in the cool water and it turns out it's clean as well. So you, you're floating in the cool water and you're refreshed and clean and then you drink as much cool water as you like and that's described as sukha. That's what sukha is. So, so I think of sukha as when you come back into balance and sukha in terms of the etymology of the word literally does mean true not in terms of truth or honesty, but true in terms of like a wheel, when you true a wheel. So when you're, when you're truing a wheel, so dukkha is when the wheel is out of true. Uh, du means out of balance or not quite right, and ka is the center of a wheel, the hub of a wheel. So dukkha is when the hub of the wheel is wobbling around and not true, not centered. So sukha is when the hub of the wheel is centered and it's and it's true and then uh poly scholars might get at me for this one because uh, i kind of made it up but uh upeka it's actually not the same ka but upeka i think of as the true within the true so so upeka is when so dukkha is when the the wheel is out of true sukha is when the wheel is in true and upeka is when you've trued the wheel more and more and more till it's reached a point of perfection. And that's like upeka, when the wheel is perfect. And so you have piti is going toward the oasis. Sukha is when you jump in the water, drink as much cool water as you like. You're bathed, you're fully cooled off. Upeka is you, you get out of the water and sit and you're perfectly content and sitting in the shade of a tree with a cool breeze coming up so we could think of these three qualities piti sukha and upeka and that's that's one way that's one way to understand equanimity or equipoise is you could think of it as the true within the true or even perfect balance a sense of perfect balance also in terms of the the 
uh, academic or textual teachings in the suttas on the jhanas. The fourth jhana is where equanimity is lifted up as the, uh, as the prominent quality, having set aside happiness and suffering, equanimity, pure, it's mindfulness purified by equanimity. So, so this is equanimity is in that, that state of, of great equipoise. Also just, uh, yeah, I guess on an academic level in terms of what the Buddha teaches about the four jhanas, he, it, in, uh, in, the t in not all lineages of the Thai forest tradition, probably Ajahn Buddhadasa, he links the four jhanas with the four Brahma Viharas. So Metta being the first, Karuna being the second, Mudita being the third, and uh, Upeka being the fourth, which is also another way to contemplate those four Brahma Viharas. For example, uh, backing up to Mudita, there's a very interesting phrasing in the third jhana, which is very unusual, and I've wondered at it for a very long time. And it says, uh, and the noble ones announce, the noble ones announce, this one has a pleasant abiding and with equanimity and is mindful. So equanimity is lifted up, but also it's linked with mudita. So it's almost like you get to that point and you, you're on the radar. You're on the radar of the noble ones. You're getting within the vicinity of Nibbana. So you're on the radar with that sense of in that inner smile, the strong inner smile, the sense of rejoicing, sense of strong gratitude, and those wholesome qualities are starting to become very ripe and getting ready to come to fruition. And just another point to make is learning something I think in the time so far that I've been as a bhikkhu that I've reflected on that's very, very important and that I think about all the time these days is how to discern between the unwholesome and the wholesome. So one of the ways the Buddha said to know that we're making progress in the practice is if wholesome dhammas are increasing and unwholesome dhammas are dis decreasing. And yet that can seem kind of vague and not really sure, well, what's wholesome, what's unwholesome. So one of the uh, qualities of when the Buddha talks about stream entry, the, the sotapanna state, is that one is one gives up Sakaya Ditti, Sila Bhattabharamasa, and Vichikicha. That's Sakaya Ditti being self view or coarser personality view, you can think of it that way. Uh, gives up attachment to rites and rituals and gives up doubt. But then that doubt is not just doubt in the uh, true nature of Buddha Dhamma Sangha, it's also doubt in terms of what's wholesome and unwholesome. So it says, the phraseology says, one is no longer perplexed as to wholesome and unwholesome states. So, but we don't have to get to that point to know what's wholesome and unwholesome, I don't think, but we, we learn over time, we get a feeling for what's wholesome and unwholesome. We get a feeling for what's wholesome and unwholesome, and that comes through developing a certain compass for knowing when we do certain actions, we automatically have that sense of conscience that comes up and, oh, what did I just say? What did I just do? And that, that feeling, that, that's showing us something. That's showing us that maybe we did something that was unwholesome. And then there's a feeling, there's a sense that we can gain as to, okay, well, what I just said, that was helpful. That was true. That was helpful. It was timely. And... I feel good about it, and it looks like this other person feels good about it. So that's how we gain a sense for what's wholesome. But it's difficult because I think to gain that sense of wholesome and unwholesome, we really do need to keep precepts in practice for a long time. Be because if we're just if we're just kind of shooting in the dark, uh, we're not going to gain that dhamma compass that uh, that shows us when we're cultivating the wholesome and when we're falling into the unwholesome. But it is something that I think comes about over time. We do develop this, this compass where we can actually see that we could even think of it as a, sen a strong sense of uh, right and wrong in terms of our own actions, of how we're conducting ourselves by body, speech, and mind. But it does take time. It takes, it takes training. 
Uh, there's certain things that the Buddha teaches that we can be sure are wholesome. For example, the goodwill, for the gratitude, these brahmaviharas. We can, the certain tools that the Buddha gives us that we don't have any doubt, if we're able to do them, those are very, very wholesome. If we are able to wish ourselves well and actually mean it, there's no doubt that that's wholesome. And when things are wholesome, we feel very happy. We're very happy. When things are tending towards the unwholesome, we're negative, low, uh, not good, not happy. When things are wholesome and the mind is wholesome, there's brightness, clarity, spaciousness, a sense of uplift and a wholesome energy that comes up and a sense of, you know, yeah, it's, everything's, everything's good, everything's, everything's great. So even though maybe everything isn't great, but uh, there is that feeling. Or like, uh, I'll just end with something that Long Paul Liam said in a Dhamma talk in 2004, and I only, it's not that I have a photographic memory, but I, I just remember it because certain things stick with me, and I think about them over and over again over the years. And he said uh, in this Dhamma talk that he gave up at our ordination platform in the forest one evening, he said, there are certain ways that you know if you or somebody else is suffering or if they're happy. And it's because if, if you tend to criticize, so if, you, if, you, if you're doing a lot of criticizing, uh, that means there's suffering happening. So if we, if we criticize, then, then we're, that's a sign that we're suffering. If we praise, that's a sign that we're happy. So sometimes through uh, our praise and criticism, we can know how we ourselves are doing. We can turn the light back to, to check in with ourselves, how we ourselves are doing. So that when, we're, when we feel very happy, when there's sukha, when there's a sense of balance in the heart, then we're gonna see positivity everywhere. We're gonna see positivity everywhere. And when there's a sense of imbalance or, or disease, then we're going to see negativity everywhere. That's that's just how it goes. So to try to try to curb that, to try to curb that, and try to bring it more toward the wholesome, and it's going to be such a relief, such a relief to be able to come back to that. These are just some brief reflections. I think I hope that uh, this is useful, and uh, I think I'll just leave it at that for the Dhamma talk. Handamayang damakataya sadhu karam tatama se sadhu 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 anumodani Thank you, Donna John. So we can open things up to questions, or if anybody had anything they wanted to share. Uh, we'll have a mic runner here, so if you've got a question, you can just, Miles has got the mic there, and you can just raise your hand, and Miles will bring the mic to you. And for people on Zoom, if you just wanted to raise your cartoon hand, then um, yeah, Sid or Cheryl can call on you as well on Zoom. Uh, hi, uh, two questions. First, did I miss my opportunity to offer Donna? <laughs> or We can do it afterwards, that sounds great. Sweet, thank you. <laughs> um, and then the second question is, um, in the suttas, uh, what's the distinction between PT and the first jhana? Yeah, yeah, piti is one of the qualities, one of the hallmarks of the first jhana. So, so there's five qualities. There's uh, vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata. And so that's, uh, we translate that normally as applied and sustained thought. Uh, piti, joy or rapture, sukha, happiness, ekagata, uh, one-pointedness or, or singleness of purpose. So all those qualities are there. So um, piety is 
uh, is just one of the factors that needs to be present for that state that we call first jhana to to have to be to, for it to uh, come about. Yeah. A lot of that is that's why we talk about cultivating these states, these individual states. So actually having things like piti and sukha more uh, developed and just ingrained qualities of the heart. It's not something you just give rise to when you're trying to get those uh, develop those states of meditation. But it's actually something that I, I think uh, my own personal opinion about these these jhanas or these states of meditation is that they're very natural things that come about once all those qualities are cultivated then it's something that's natural that the mind is going to naturally lean into when things like pity and sukha and vitaka vichara ekagata are vitaka vichara that's we can couple that with a quality of dhamma vichaya or thinking and reflecting on Dhamma all the time, that's, uh, that's gonna go into Vitaka Vichara, which is normally described as the ability to give rise to and sustain a meditation object. Um, and then Piti Sukha, Ekagata, singleness of purpose, like keeping the mind on a single theme, not necessarily having to be a laser point, but actually just keeping the mind on a single theme, the Buddha says we can even do analytic meditations like, for example, the nine charnel ground contemplations in, in Kayagata Sati, the mindfulness of the body or element contemplation, actually going through the body, visualizing or verbally thinking of different parts of the body as elements, as just elements, not me, not mine. Um, we're allowed to do all of that and that's all within that, that's all allowed within that framework of meditation. Ajahn, uh, just to add on to that briefly, um, Longpur Cha was cautious sometimes about speaking to uh, focusing in on the numbers of the jhanas, which are these deep states of concentration, and people can get very hung up on which jhana you're reaching, and there's so much debate about what those even mean um, in the West at the moment. Um, so Longpur Cha would often speak about the qualities that Ajahn Yanako is pointing out instead. So really focusing just because those are really tangible, you can really see how they are in your experience, like directed thought and evaluation, thinking about an object, sort of how do you direct the mind, that falls away, um, but there's also at the first jhana, yeah, that sense of refreshment and pity, um, rapture, and then sukha, ease, and then unification, ekagata, and I just think there's a lot of wisdom in raising those qualities up as what we really look to in our experience, rather than aiming for these certain rarefied states, which which are somewhat debated anyways. So there's a lot of benefit in Ajahn just spelling out a lot of what rapture or pity really means in day-to-day in -day life, actually. I think it's much more accessible for people. Hi, uh, thank you for a wonderful Dhamma talk. I, I had a question about what you talked about, about cultivating wholesome qualities. Um, if somebody is going through an illness or a disease, whether physically or mentally, that, let's say, physically causes pain or agitation or frustration in, in the body, and also, like, mentally, like, to illnesses that people go through that hampers and something like depression that kind of creates these negative states of mind. And it could also make like something like meditation difficult to do. So in a case like that, how do you suggest um, we practice? Yeah, with, with uh, difficulties that might be a, an obstacle to being able to focus clearly or being able to practice or being able to make the mind wholesome or get the mind in, into a wholesome state. The ideal thing is if there's a, a practice done before that that can come up to help us at that time. But if that's not the case and we're getting interested in practice while 
we're first getting interested while we're within those difficult physical states, say uh, have cancer or um, something else, then uh, that can be very, very difficult. Uh, ideally, someone would have started to practice before then. So right at the time of death is not really the time to start practicing. That's why, that's why we're doing this now. However, somebody... Um, you know, might actually, in, in extraordinary cases, might get interested in, in practice through the, like an illness might be what pushes them into wanting to practice, for example. And it's not necessarily the case that the pain has to make the mind unwholesome. Uh, so, but it will be more difficult to practice and they have to have a courageous, almost heroic mind to be able to look at the pain and, and analyze it in a way that's going to be helpful. So there's a, this is the example I'll give is actually somebody who had been practicing a long time before she got cancer. She's passed away now, but uh, a student of Ajahn Jaya Saro's in Thailand, and she contracted bone cancer, which is supposed to be very, very painful, one of the most painful forms of cancer. And she, she decided to not take any painkillers up until the time of her death through the entire cancer process. And she decided just to meditate on the pain and watch the pain, and then uh, just before she died, she was extremely radiant and very, very inspiring to see and very, very bright. So her mind was actually able to go into the wholesome through this, but she had a, a she had been practicing for most of her life already. So that gave her the foundation. You would have to have some sort of foundation to be able to do that. If you don't have that foundation, then it is allowable to manage the pain with painkillers. It would have been totally okay for her to take painkillers and sometimes people get worried well I might not be able to have much mindfulness or be clear if I take too many painkillers but it can be managed in a way that maybe there's some at least the pain is managed and there's still some clarity can uh, do that as well um, but to start practicing uh, well when you're within the state of extreme pain would be very very difficult yeah Thank you for your talk. I get hung up a lot on self, non-self. Um, and uh, having experienced a lot of historical trauma and, and hearing that from members of the Sangha, uh, there needs to be a lot of development of metta and compassion. Uh, and at the same time, theoretically, I understand the concept of non-self and, and more of a concept of oneness, but I, I just get hung up on like how much, how much emphasis do you place on, on the self to eventually let go of the self? What's the, what's the path or gateway to that? Yeah, so with trauma, like these things actually did happen to us. And so it's not saying, well, that was somebody else. You know, that would be dissociating. So to, uh, it, it's not self is a reflection. It's the characteristic of all conditioned existence. So there's three characteristics. There's not just not self, but there's anicca, dukkha, and anatta. All of these go together. And it's said that, uh, I believe it's a teaching of Ajahn Mahabhua, where he said that any pra all practitioners will if they develop wisdom, it'll be through uh, one of those characteristics more than the others. So for Ajahn Mahabhua himself, it was through anatta that he developed insight, but for, for Lungpur Cha, it was anicca. That's why he always talks about anicca in his Dhamma talks. He's always talking about not sure. That was the angle he came at anicca with, was, was saying all, he didn't say th all things are impermanent. He said all things are not sure. So, so in terms of say something like trauma, it's not just trying to get rid of it or, or push it down through a contemplation of not-self, but it's actually seeing, uh, reflecting on it, reflecting on it, and you could say even, I like this phrase, metabolizing trauma. So actually, you're not trying to get rid of it, or PTSD, I've heard about uh, mindfulness-based practices that can actually uh, help cure people from PTSD, and I, I know a Dhamma teacher who was who through his practice was able to 
cure himself of PTSD from being a, a veteran. And so, so and, and I'm actually, the more people I meet, because I'm in a position of uh, a leadership now and, and a, a teacher, so I, I meet many, many people, and I, I actually am starting to think that everybody has trauma. So and that, and that trauma could just be another translation for dukkha. So, so like there is trauma, like the first noble truth, there is trauma. <laughs> like just, just actually, uh, uh, so everybody's traumatized in some way or another. And whether it's our friend betraying us or everybody's had something happen, unless you've led the most sheltered life possible, but then you'd be traumatized because of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everybody has trauma. So how do we, so we're all in this together then. So there, that can help, just that sense that we're all in this together, that how can, how can, we, uh, how can we all deal with this? Of course, some people have more acute, ho horrific trauma than others, but how, how do we deal with this? So I think that contemplation of not sure, so we have memories of certain things, but then the memory keeps changing. We have stories about certain things, the story keeps changing. So actually seeing that the story is not sure, and sometimes we keep the, the way we keep the trauma going is by continually rewriting the story or continually reciting the story also. So that's how we keep it going. But as we recite the story, it does get rewritten and edited in various ways, sometimes to make it worse. So can we start to rewrite the story in a way that alleviates it, that starts to lessen it? Is that a possibility as well? And these are just skillful means, what we call upaya, to, because um, there, there is in it, for, for the unwholesome mind, there is kind of a strange, almost perverse addiction that we were doing things to make the mind more unwholesome. And there's this, there is this, this charge that we get from it, from say getting very, very angry or very frustrated. We do get a charge from that even though it's horribly unpleasant and it, it's something. So to actually, the, the thing is that we intellectually know that the teachings say to do this and this and this, and we, we feel that that's right, but then deep down inside, the heart doesn't really understand it yet. So on a heart level, we still want that charge from the unwholesome. We still want that charge from you know, being able to say, yes, this happened to me, and I am, you know, I was hurt really bad by this, and to have that assuredness. So it can be difficult sometimes to go into that new territory of the wholesome just because it's not known, just because it's not familiar. And sometimes getting out of suffering can be difficult because at least, this, at least we know what it is. So, the, so there's this fear of the unknown. And I've come up against this a lot that, oh, there's this wall I've come up against in my practice. Why is that there? Because I know this is suffering, but at least the suffering is familiar. So if, if I try to get out of that, then I'm going into something unfamiliar, the unknown. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. So if I have this and this and this on my Google Calendar, at least there are things I don't want to do, but at least they're there. So I know what's going to happen. So there's that taking refuge in knowing what's going to happen. But then if the Google Calendar is just empty, well, that, then there might be that sense of, oh, oh no, like, what's going what's to happen? That's a little bit of a tangent, but yeah, there's some reflections about that. Maybe just uh, pointing out one um, sort of paradox of the Dhamma is that for the most part, the Buddha was speaking about not self. Nothing in the world is worthy of being clung to. <laughs> Everything is, is not self. Um, but there are places where the Buddha does talk about Atta sampada, accomplishment of self. So there is a place for healthy ego development, um, and one can. Sorry, I have to correct that term. Please, because I, I studied that term, atta bhava. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe there's another. It's in the Diga Nikaya. It's, it's the the cultivation of self. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that that probably comes up as well. So yeah. I didn't mean to. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's good. But, uh, Yeah, Atta Sampada comes up in the Sangyutta Nikaya. With it's one of the, um, I didn't know about that. you know, these these are the um, the dawns of the Dhamma. When the 
uh, Buddha talks about these different, just as um, the dawn is the precursor to the rising of the sun of daylight, uh, so too there are these different things which are the precursor to the rising of the path. And the Buddha talks about accomplishment in, uh, in chanda or wholesome desire accomplishment in having good friends, kalyanamitta, like Ajahn um, Yanako was talking about, but also this yeah, accomplishment in a healthy ego function. So being able to say, yeah, I'm someone who's generous. I'm someone who's, um, yeah, has a sense of integrity. That's also part of the path. And so knowing in the course of a treatment, whether that's the treatment of the path, the course of um, therapy, sitting meditation, talking to a therapist, um, knowing what's the right thing, what's the right antidote, is it, yeah, leaning into the stories about ourselves and having a good story that we can tell about ourselves, or knowing when we have to drop the stories and leaning into, there's also a place for oneness, perceptions of, of oneness, perceptions of non-duality. And if that's meaningful for you, and even better than if it's meaningful, if you can actually like tap into feeling it, which can definitely happen, way leaning into that when you can and when you feel it's helpful. You all just saw a rare event. It's a poly face-off that may be the only one you ever get to see. It's a, it's a precious moment, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, debate. The Tibetans would clap like that. <laughs> just... This term came up during winter retreat, and it was actually very, very funny because I was reading from a list of terms in the Diginikaya, and it's, it's a sutta attributed to Sariputta, and one of these things to be cultivated is atabhava, but then it's translated as getting a new personality, <laughs> which it's, yeah, so I, I thought that's probably, that can't be correct. Like, how can you just get a new personality? Just also to add on to this, um, the Buddha divided the Noble Eightfold Path into three sections. There's sila, or ethics, samadhi, development of wholesome mind states, unification of mind, and wisdom, which is seeing all things in terms of the three characteristics or the Four Noble Truths, like Ajahn Nyanako was saying. And I think when we talk about looking at trauma um, and these stories, a lot of it's to do with wisdom. You're sort of looking at how these things came up, how they were conditioned, you're seeing them as conditioned, as impermanent, as not you, but just these patterns. But it is a path of diminishing returns in that after a time, it's almost like if you're just hashing out the same stories again and again, it's like being in one of those old Western movie scenes where the shop fronts are just cardboard, you know, or plywood, and you're just holding them up after a while. And I think it's difficult because this is one of the few tools that Western therapy has available to it. But if that's the only tool, then you can just end up reinforcing those same narratives after a time. And I think the word trauma is in danger of being reinforced to that point in the West at the moment. So there is something to be said for sila and samadhi, ethics and unification of mind or emotional development. It's Ajahn Mahabua said that when you look at things in terms of wisdom, you see everything as not self. But when you look at things in terms of sila and samadhi, you're looking at things in terms of self. And you're developing this bright heart. And that has this immense healing power, like the healing power of the precepts. And if you're practicing, if you're really cultivating giving and meditation, then a lot of, it's kind of like placing a grenade in the middle of that like old Western, it just blows the walls down. So I, I think that's really one of the benefits of the Buddhist path is, yes, you're looking at these patterns, but you're also developing a heart which transcends them, which is what Ajahn Kovilo was pointing to at the oneness as well. So. I think we have someone on Zoom, please. Person in upper left corner. What's his name? Jorge, please. Good morning. Thank you for the Dhamma talk. I've been practicing the Brahma Viharas for a long time. And also, I like body contemplation, but not always found a clear answer of how to better uh, practice body contemplation. So my question is, can I use Upeka as the platform to launch body contemplation with wisdom? Thank you. 
Yeah, for, for anybody who does things like uh, body contemplation over a long period of time, then questions like these will come up that uh, getting down to the nitty gritty of practice or finding new ways, finding new ways to do body contemplation. And certainly any practice can be tempered with upeka, with equanimity, because, and body contemplation is no different, and especially because if we're sincere with something like, say, a suba, where we're actually contemplating the unattractive nature of our own body and the bodies of others, then the mind can become negative because there's something in us that doesn't really, we only want beauty, we only want that which is wonderful and good. So if we, if we start mentally peeling the body apart and looking at the organs in the body and trying to imagine they're, they're there all the time and the, the true nature of these things we're carrying around, all the time with us, then it's only natural that the mind can sink into negativity if it's if the if the angle is just slightly wrong. Because we're looking at it, we're looking at the not self nature of the body. We're not trying to say, "I'm disgusting. I'm full of crap." And, you know, we're not trying to take that angle, but to see the not self nature. But the as we saw in the um, the, re the whole reason the Buddha taught the Anapanasati Sutta was when he taught body contemplation to a number of monks. Then uh, the Buddha went off and to do self retreat for two weeks, uh, do his own solitary retreat. And then these monks were very. Uh, this is in the Vinaya in the origin story to Parajika three against uh, where uh, one of our uh, most heavy precepts: if we were to kill a human being, we'd no longer be monks automatically. And so. Um, this is where the Buddha goes into retreat and the monks are sincerely doing body contemplation and becoming horrified and humiliated by their own bodies and actually committing suicide and getting each other to, getting other, others to kill them as well. And then there's a wanderer from another sect who they get to kill them. And uh, they're, the monks are actually lining up to be killed by this, this person. And the Buddha comes out of retreat and you might wonder why didn't the Buddha detect this in his retreat and the answer is because he was completely in emptiness the whole time. But anyway, that's an aside. Uh, but he, was, he comes out of retreat and says, Ananda, the Sangha seems diminished. <laughs> and he says, well, you Lord, you taught them body contemplation. They became disgusted and humiliated. It's interesting nobody went to get the Buddha either. Like it, like it wasn't considered that big of a deal. Like it was just kind of normal, I guess, in India at that time. But, uh, but then he says, monks, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in long, one knows I breathe in long, breathing out long. So he, see, he teaches on Upanasati then. And um, so it's all very matter of fact and kind of deadpan. But, uh, but yeah, to, that's all to say that yes, tempering it with equanimity is a very good thing. And to know that the reason for body contemplation is to gain insight into the not self nature of the body that you know which part can i identify with which part can i say is me that's the whole reason for it and so equanimity to temper it you know inserting equanimity there in the beginning but then also very deep equanimity is is the is the intended result of it as well so you, you know, like teachings of Ajahn Mahabhu where he's talking about uh, fluctuating between body contemplation or just breath meditation. And that uh, when he gained some insight into body contemplation, the mind actually became more peaceful than it could ever could have been through just breath meditation. So it really, it really does go both ways. You can insert equanimity at the beginning and the result will be equanimity. Thank you, Ajahn, for Just one more. for the beautiful talk. I my question is, um, yeah, when it's someone is suffering through a very uh, bad situation or cancer, it's very hard time at that time and practice. It more seems like um, you have a deadline, and then students have to study. Like, oh my goodness. Um, freaks out and study. But it's also challenging when things are going uh, pretty easy, let's say. 
when you're young and good looking and everyone loves you and you have friends and you, you're you're doing financially good and everything uh, those times are challenging too sometimes you deviate from the path and as you're saying you have been a monk for uh, 20 plus years what what is the most important thing you'd say to focus when someone is having a good time and uh, so that they can continue practicing 20 more years or so thank you yeah, that's another hindrance and could be even more difficult than, say, having a severe illness or, or cancer or something like that than in terms of the practice, in terms of getting ourselves to practice. Because when things are good, as Ajahn Shah said, uh, you know, everybody wants to let go of the wheel when they're being crushed by it on the bottom, but nobody wants to let go of the wheel when, it's, when they're on the top. So when we're on the top, that's the time where we're supposed to let go. That's the time where we're holding on to the wheel at the top and we're supposed to let go. But then when we're being crushed on the bottom, we're not even holding on to it. We're just being crushed by it and we can't get, get away from it when we're being crushed by the wheel. So, so actually, you know, that, that is that it's, yeah, if, if everything's great, of course, it's going to be nearly impossible to contemplate things like death and aging and impermanence, you know, if we're young, attractive, charming, and have tons of friends and party all the time and everything's good and we're healthy and strong and doing sports and whatever, then of course we're not, we're not going to be inclined to reflect on any of these things because things are great. The, the problem is then uh, there have been cases where uh, people like this, aging still happens. It still happens. At the end of the party, you have to go home. And uh, at, and then sometimes you get injured, and sometimes you get in a car accident. Sometimes things just these things happen. So then uh, there have been cases, many cases actually, of people committing suicide when they reach the age of fifty. And the note will almost always say like, you know, everything was so great. I I partied and I had lots of friends and everything was good. What happened? So, and that's, that's like what the suicide note would say. So, so it's like we, we can think of cases like that and actually say, well, maybe, maybe there is something to this, you know, thinking about old age. Or there's been a case that I heard about where uh, uh, it was actually a, a guy who was a teacher and he was a tri triathlon runner or did triathlons and was really fit, really in great shape, uh, had a family, kids, and then um, I had this, uh, this woman I had never met before. She showed up at Abayagiri one day, this is a few years ago, and um, said, well, you know, I don't know what to do. Perfect marriage for 34 years, kids, and then he just took off. He just took off. No explanation. I saw I started asking, well, what's, what's going on? And uh, she said, well, you know, he did triathlons and was a teacher and everything was great. And then he started, his energy started waning and he couldn't do the triathlons anymore. And uh, things started going downhill a bit and he got some illnesses and he's in his mid sixties or whatever. And then he just had this crisis and just took off. And, and I don't know what's going on. And, and uh, so uh, what's going on is he never contemplated aging. And it's like, oh, suddenly, you know, I, I just didn't think about it ending. I didn't think about the energy waning. And so if we contemplate impermanence, aging, and even death, that really keeps us with the practice. And then as things, as things evolve in our lives, then we're prepared for those truths that, that happen to everybody. But if we're, um, this is where I think of the profundity of the Buddha's life story. So the Buddha, as it says in the story of how the Buddha went through this process of deciding to leave the home life and become a monk at the age of 28. I say 28 because uh, they say he was in his 29th year, so. I'm going to maybe be controversial and say he was actually 28. And where he said, three intoxications faded from my mind that allowed me to leave the home life and seek what is good. 
and that was through the reflection and the contemplation on illness, the intoxication with health faded from my mind. Through the reflection and contemplation on aging and seeing older people, the, any intoxication connected with youth faded from my mind. And through seeing a dead person and contemplating death, any intoxication with even this very life faded from my mind. That's when he decided to go forth. So uh, those are the, if we're completely lost in those intoxications, then there's no way we're gonna be able to practice. But if we start reflecting on those things, it's only natural that we'll start to realize the intense sobriety that we're looking for. Thank you very much, Donna Janka. And thank you everybody for your questions. Um, so at the end of our meetings, we request um, Cheryl or Kirk to read the Blessing Braid. This is a list of people on our website. If you